All right. Right, take your Bibles. Let's go to the book of John. I want to carry on where we left off last week and uh, with uh, 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 whatever. Whatever. Isn't that a nice word? Come on, say it there where you're sitting. Whatever. Come on, in your house, portable, I can't hear you. Whatever. Come on, whatever. That's such a good word. Amen. All right, you go to John 12. I'll tell you where to go now. All right. Now, uh, uh, something that came up this week in my heart was this, that, you know, there are some people that will say anything just for the sake of saying something. There are some people, even preachers, that will say anything just for the sake of saying something. But not with Jesus. Not so with Jesus, all right? When Jesus, I wrote this down, when Jesus said something, then that must have been what the Father wanted us to hear. That is what the Father, when Jesus spoke, when He opened His mouth, when He said something and it was written down, then that must have been what the Father wanted us to hear. So when He said, whatever you ask, I believe that that is what the Father wanted us to hear, whatever we ask. Jesus never wasted any words. So that is what the Father wanted us to hear, what he wanted us to know, and what he wanted us to have. All right? So, John chapter 12. Verse, go to verse 49. We're going to dissect the word. We're going to look at the word, and you're going to be equipped by the word. So don't think, oh, I've heard this before. Listen to it as though you're hearing it for the first time. That is how I approach the word. I approach the word not, oh, but Willie, you've been preaching this for so many times. Uh, you've been over this so many times. You know it. You can say it by heart. No, no, that doesn't matter. I, when I open my Bible, and that's why I like to get a, uh, the new Bible, with my new Bible. As now I can read it again from another perspective, and that's how you get the revelations. All right? Not because, oh, I know this. No, there are hidden stuff. There's so much hidden stuff that we still don't understand, comprehend, that we still don't, didn't lay hold of that needs to be revealed to us. All right. So verse 49, John 12, verse 49. For I have not spoken on my own. Now you will see that in your Bibles, authority is an italic. So authority is not in the original Greek. All right? So what does he says? For I have not spoken on my own. That word own on my, by myself. So there was something else, someone else that was influencing Jesus to say what he said. Come on, you've got to stick with me now. There was someone else, something else, that was influencing Jesus to say what he was saying. So I have not spoken on my own. But the Father, here it comes, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. So the Father commanded Jesus what he should say. It was a command. Now that little word command, and I don't want to impress you with the Greek and the stuff like that, but there's something in it that I, that I picked up this morning, that I saw this morning, and I went and I checked it out, and this is so awesome. Now he says that, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say. Now that little word command means an authoritative a prescription, an authoritative, so it's a prescription with authority. Now in the law, in law, in legal terms, I didn't write this down, I'm trying to remember now what I saw. In legal terms, when you use the word prescription in legal terms, it means to write off your debt. 
It means as they get rid, the, the, the judge gets rid. That's an authoritative prescription. So Jesus says, but I have not spoken on my own, but my Father have given me a command. An authoritative prescription. Now, you've got to understand this in line with the whatever. With the whatever. There's an authoritative prescription that has the power and the ability to write off our debts. Whether it's sinful debt, whether it is to make right with God, whether it is uh, a financial debts, whether it is promises that we made, the word, the whatever, the word that Jesus spoke has authority to cancel every debt that we owe. Now, I, I'm, I'm just going to jump a bit. Um, I didn't get to it when we did the, uh, you know, when Jesus said, whatever, whatsoever you ask in prayer, you still remember that? Whatsoever you ask in prayer, if you believe. And then Jesus said in Matthew 6, he says, in this manner, pray. Before that, he said that when you pray, you go into your room. I'm not going to go over that again. Into your room and you close the door. Your room is the storehouse. And then you begin to declare from your storehouse, not from your circumstances. You don't pray from your circumstances. You don't pray from under your circumstances, trying to get yourself above your circumstances. That's the natural man. That's by the natural man. But the spiritual man will take the spirit man and put it in that place called the heavenlies, called authority, called the throne room, and then begin to address, because in that throne room, in the heavenlies, is your storehouse. That's where everything is that you need. That is where your, where your finances are, your prosperity. That's where your healing is. That is where your breakthrough is. That is where your joy is. That is with whatever you need is in that sphere, is in that atmosphere called heaven heavenlies, called the throne room. So now you ascend in the spirit realm from th to that place and you begin to address your circumstances from that place. You don't try and get from here to there. You get it from there to here. You got that? All right. So then Jesus said, okay, then in this manner pray, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. Now you've got to understand that. That word debt means something that you own. That you owe. And forgive those who gave us this debt. So Father, forgive that. All these people that send me all these free credit cards. Now I've got 17, 11 credit cards that I've got to pay off and all that kind of stuff. So Jesus says, pray this. Father, forgive me for my debts. Now, debt in itself, uh, please, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Debt is not right. It's not good. But sometimes there are debt that you, or they, that you go into that you can afford that you pay. You can't afford to pay it. You rent a house for 10,000 rand. But you can own a house that you can pay off for 10,000 rand a month. You can afford that. It's within your budget. You don't go and rent a house of 10,000 rand and you only get 1,000 rand a month. That's going to put you in debt. So now you go and borrow money and borrow money and before long, you'll find yourself in debt. And I think that the best thing is, is to begin to trust God. It's called growing in your faith. All right? So uh, I don't want to teach on that now about being debt-free and that kind of stuff, those teachings of it. But this is not the teaching for today. Okay? So something owning. So whatever. So when Jesus spoke by the commandment that God gave him, it was to get you to be free. You've got to understand that. To get you to be free from sickness, to get you to be free from diseases, to get you to be free from, from whatever it is, from debt, from lack, to get you to have a life that you can live free. 
from bondages and toil and sweat and struggling. Amen? All right. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that His command is everlasting life. Oh man, now I want to teach on immortality. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I just want to, you know, there's that pause, that, that, that dramatic silence. Okay, so listen to it again. And I know that His command is everlasting life. Okay, I'm gonna ask this question. How many of you really believe in everlasting life? Not after life. Oh, I don't want to teach on this now. I'm going to save this for another time. Okay. But everlasting life means to live forever. Now, I don't want to live forever. And, uh, oh, but, okay, but let's leave it at that. I don't want to live forever in debt. I don't want to live forever with, 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 with uh, uh, having to pay a lot of debt off and lack and poverty and with sickness and disease. I don't want to have everlasting life with that. But I have a command. I have a command that was spoken by the Son of the Most High God called Jesus Christ. That says something. That said, whatever. He didn't say something just for the sake of saying something. He said, whenever I open my mouth to speak, what I say is a direct command from heaven. It's a direct command from our commander in chief. It's a direct command from the father himself to his sons and to his daughters. So Jesus says, I say unto you, whatsoever you ask the father in my name. If you believe it, you can have it. That's a command that I have from the father. And that command is authoritative prescriptions and that authoritative prescription has a legal meaning and the legal lawful meaning is, is that you can be free from debt. You can be free from everything that you own. You can live a life of freedom. Freedom from, from sickness, disease, freedom from lack and poverty. I have a command to tell you whatsoever. But the natural man. But the natural man. The natural man wants to kick in and say, how is this going to be possible? How is this going to be possible? I, if it was possible, you wouldn't need faith. So the problem is not, is it possible or is it impossible? The problem is, is what are you doing with your faith? How much of your faith are you exercising? I think, I think my son did it on Thursday evening when he spoke to you about, oh, increase our faith, increase. We, we all want to, our faith to increase, our faith to increase. You know your faith can increase. Did you know your faith can increase? But your faith will only increase when you abide by certain prescriptions in the Word. We're going to get to that. But we all have been given a measure of faith. And the faith that you need, you don't need big faith. To move the mountain. You don't need big faith. To get out of debt. You need faith as a mustard seed. So imagine if you can use that little bit of faith. If you can use it. A lot of people don't even use it. That little bit of faith that you have. Can move mountains. That little bit of faith. Alright. So I don't want to teach on faith now. So, therefore, whatever I speak, His command is everlasting life. Oh, yeah. So, I don't want to go through life full of debt and live three, four hundred years battling to pay off my debts and stuff like that. The time has come, and uh, someone said something on social media on, 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 a, uh, on something that I shared and made a comment there. And, uh, uh, and I said, you know what? Uh, the Lord showed me in, the, in December 2019 already, November, December, that there's something going, that, that there's something that's going to come through the air that's going to affect us. Something through the air. And then I had a dream. And I didn't know that this was going to come from China. It's, it's in my dream book. Let me just get it. It's, it's, it's in my book. I want to show it to you. It's in my book. Then I had a dream. There's, there, there's the, uh, can you see it there? Okay, there's the sketch I made. Then I had a dream. 
This dream was on the 27th of, of uh, December. This dream was on the 27th of December. Then I had a dream. And I dreamt of a submarine. And the submarine had a cannon on it, but the cannon was facing backwards towards the submarine. But the cannon was like a Chinese ornament. And it was firing backwards, hitting itself. And then what happened? I had a word from the Lord. Something is in the air that's going to affect us. I had a dream of a submarine that's equipped with a Chinese ornamental cannon that's going to shoot backwards, but it's going to affect all of us. But we don't have to fear it. It's going to sink itself. And what happened? The virus came through the air from China. All right? But this thing is not supposed and will not affect us. But many people have died of this virus. You can ask them why they died. The pastors that have died. Don't ask me why they then have died. Ask them why they have died. To me, they've become martyrs because they stepped out and they did believe the word of God. But just because they died doesn't mean that we must now stop believing the word of God. Come on now. Just because we don't stop preaching healing and laying hands on the sick just because people don't, some people don't get healed. We keep on doing it. We keep on doing it until we see the manifestation of what the word of God says. Because that's what God wants us to know. God wants us to know you will lay hands upon the sick because Jesus said it and he had a command from the Father to say it. You go and lay hands on the sick. These signs will follow those that believe. In my name you will cast out demons. You will lay hands upon the sick. And they just might be happy and lucky enough to recover. No, they will recover. But just because we've laid hands on someone now and it seems like this person didn't recover, we don't stop laying hands on the person. I'm going to lay hands on the next one and the next one and the next one. That's my responsibility. The healing is his responsibility. Your receiving it is your responsibility. It's not my responsibility to receive it for you. It's your responsibility to receive your healing when hands are laid upon you. And it's God's responsibility to manifest the power. Okay, therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So when Jesus opened his mouth, he spoke, and it was because of the Father's authority. The Father said to him, tell my people this, say this to the people, say that to the people, say that to the people. Amen. Right, let's go to where we ended off last week. Go to 1 John, right at the back of your Bible before Revelations. Go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Let's read from verse 14. This is where we ended last week. Now this is the confidence, the assurance that we have in Him. This is the assurance that we have. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. If we ask anything according to His will. So now you have people. Father, if it is your will, you can heal me. If it is your will, you can help me get out of this debt. If it is your will, you can open the doors for me for a better job. If it is your will. That's a doubtful, unfaithful. I'm looking for some stronger words. Type of declaration of prayer depriving you from the very power you are supposed to have. Because that shows that you don't know His will. Is it His will for us 
to be healed. Yes, for by his stripes you were healed. It's past tense. It's done. You will lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. It's a done deal. That is His will. So I don't have to ask Him if it is your will. I know it is His will. So I have confidence. I have uh, uh, the assurance that if I ask in His name, Father, this is your will for me to be healed. I ask now that you will stretch out your hand and that you will touch me or through the pastor, through the apostle, through the prophet or whatever, as they lay hands on me, that I will now receive my healing in Jesus' name. And I declare that by your stripes I am now healed. In the, I know it is His will. Father, I know it is your will for me to prosper because your word says that it is you who give me the power to get wealth. It is you that says that if I understand that I am as much in Abraham, in Christ as I am in Abraham, and as much in Abraham as I am in Christ, and the blessings that you spoke to Abraham are now fulfilled in Christ, and you said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and you will be a blessing, and I will make you wealthy and rich and strong, and I will take care of you, and, 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 and then I know that in the new in Christ, that is His will for my life, so I pray it, I declare it, I said, it is the Father's will for me to be prosperous, to be blessed, to be happy, to be joyful, to be healed in Jesus' name. That is His will. So if we know it is His will, then why do we doubt when the Word says the confidence, the assurance that we have in Him that if we ask anything, Oh, we are only allowed to ask. We should only ask spiritual things. We should only ask the Father for spiritual things. Oh, Father, make me more holy. Father, let me walk around with a long, sour face in the streets because I'm not allowed to be happy and enjoy. People must see that there is an anointing upon my life and that I am holy. So, Lord, all these other stuff are just materialistic stuff. A better car. It's okay, Lord. I'm happy in driving my old lapidated mini rusted up, breaking every block. I'm happy with that. So, Father... It's all materialistic stuff. I'm, I'm fine with the clothes that I have. Although my pants are tearing and my knees, you can see through them. I'm, I'm okay with it. Father, my, my sitting room suite is falling apart. It's torn. But it's okay. All these things are just materialistic stuff that I cannot take with me to heaven. It's because you don't know His will. It's because you don't know His will. The Word says, will give you good things to those who ask Him. Good things. Listen, listen, listen. I'm not teaching you because of Bible knowledge, because of word knowledge. Yes, I, 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 I have word knowledge. I have word knowledge. I think I, I showed it to you the other day. And uh, I'm just scratching here my, in my desk drawer. Now I can't find it. Somebody blessed me many years ago with a button that you can put on. You know, not a button, a, a button that you can put on that says, I know stuff. Because <laughs> I used to say that in portable. Give me some credit. I know stuff. And they found this button. And uh, had me wear it. I know stuff. It was so sweet. And, uh, you know, I have knowledge. I have Bible knowledge. I've been studying the Word for over 45 years. I think I know some stuff. But I also have the experience. Not just the stuff, knowledge, but also the experience. We've been there. We've been poor. Let me tell you, it's not nice to sit on a sitting room suite when we... When, we, when you sit down, you sink so deep in it that you are, actually feels like you're sitting on the floor. Or you've got to be so careful that you, when you sit down is that you don't tear 
the tear that's already there further. We had a sitting room suite like that when we got to Portable. You remember that green one? And uh, you, my, my wife had to make, she bought some material and, uh, and she made covers for it, white covers for it. And uh, just to cover the tears that was in the sitting room suite. So it's not nice. But you know when you get a better one, when you get a newer one, oh man, you don't want to drink coffee on it. You don't want to eat on it. You hardly want to sit on it because you appreciate the newness. The same with the car. The same with the new bed. You don't actually want to, you know, when you sleep on your bed. I mean, we had a bed uh, <laughs> many years ago when we lived, in, uh, we had to go and live somewhere else. We didn't have a place to live. And the double bed that we, that we, that we had, and uh, we had to put a door. Under the mattress, a door, and then fill it up on the sides with carton boxes that you that you make flat, just to keep the mattress flat. Because otherwise, if you lie on it, we all roll to the middle. Can you remember Pungster Park? That's how poor we were. So I can teach you this stuff, because we've moved from here to here, and uh, now we're gonna move to there, and we're on our way there. I actually want to stay. And uh, so, you know, so we had to put a door. And I'm serious. This is the truth. You can ask my wife. We had to put a door under the bed just to make it that we don't roll into the middle so that we can just, you know, it's okay to roll that way. So uh, I don't teach because I just have the knowledge. I, I don't know how I got there, but I think it was a good story. Whatever things you ask, according to his will. So I know what his will is for me. It's not nice to have those old, old, rusted up, broken down, falling apart stuff. And you go up to bed and you lie on the bed and you've got the spring sticking out. Poking you here on the side, you know, in the side or whatever. He hears us. When we ask according, isn't this awesome? When we ask according to his will, I have the confidence. You heard me. You heard me. And this is what is so awesome. Man, I'm, I'm putting a lot of stuff together that the Holy Spirit is leading me now. What is so awesome about God? That's why he's God. What is so awesome about our God is that in the midst of millions Crying out to God. I'm not even talking about Muslims. I'm just talking about saved Christians. People that call themselves Christians. You have people in Syria that are in dire straits. They need breakthroughs. Some of them are calling out and say, Is there a God that cares about us? I mean, it's war. Their homes have been have been. Uh, 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 destroyed with bombs and in Libya and in Iraq and in Iran and wherever and there are Christians living there and they crying out and say if there's a God where is this God and they are crying out somebody should teach them the will of the Father there are many Christians they love Jesus but they've never been taught how to move from this level to this level we're in the midst of wars. We're in the midst of Iraq. We're in the midst of Libya, of Syria. In the midst of all that, God can prosper you. Don't tell me that God is limited in those countries and it's only the Western world where there's, that God can bless and prosper you. There are poor people living in the Western world as well that live by handouts. Somebody need to teach them what the will of the Father is. Come on, you've got to hear me. I'm getting, I'm getting stirred up now. I need to get out from behind the desk to a pulpit where I can get up from and run around and slap people and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm frustrated sitting here. Help us get that property. Help us build that property from where we can preach and we can put up a satellite dish and this word can be broadcast just like Faith Channel and TBN and those others. We can restore the vision that got lost from another prophet. We can restore it. That's in my heart. It's burning in my heart. This word, everybody needs to hear this word. 
Amen. Thank you, Sheila, for that. Amen. I believe that Kingdom Lifestyle Ministries has a message that people need to hear. A message that will challenge you to begin to believe the word. That will not just make you feel comfortable. Oh, I'm okay. No, it's going to challenge you to a higher life. To a better life. Oh, to a wealthier life. Oh, but really, money is the root of evil. No, the love of money is the root of evil. We need money to get the gospel out. You know, it takes money to preach the gospel on social media. It takes money to preach the gospel on, on, on television. Even poor people have got televisions in their house. In their homes that can tune in and hear and listen to the gospel. There are places that don't have churches that can tune in. We need to get this word out to get this gospel out. Amen. People need to hear what is the will of the Father for their lives. So my God is so amazing. So awesome. That in the midst of all those cries, whatever the need is, He has the ability to hear my voice for a new car, for a better car. So don't try and put people and myself on a guilt trip. When you try and tell me you want a new car or you want a better car, but what about all the hungry children? What about all the hungry people? You don't know what we do. You don't know in whose lives this ministry have already sown. You don't know that we have already, that we have bought groceries and stuff for other people. You don't know that. So don't go and try or come and try and put your guilt on me because I'm trusting God for a better car. I can trust God for a better car and feed the poor. If we have the finances, we can, I can be blessed and we can be a blessing. Didn't God say to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and you will be a blessing and you will even bless yourself. So don't come and put your guilt on me. We need materialistic stuff on this earth. Heaven is already manifested on this earth. Even Jesus said it. He said, no one has ascended into heaven except the Son of God who came from heaven who now is in heaven. He's standing on the earth. He's standing on the earth. Challenging Cornelius. Say to him, Cornelius, he who is speaking to you now, although I'm speaking to you now, I'm speaking to you from heaven, but I'm standing on earth. Because no one has ascended into heaven, except this. So where's Elijah? Where's Moses? Where are the dead saints? How many pastors have you heard that have challenged you to think on this? Oh, when you die, you go to heaven. Jesus said no one has ascended unto heaven. Except the Son of God, Son of Man, who came down from heaven, who now is in heaven. So right here, where I'm sitting, on this chair, behind this desk, in this house, in this town, I'm in heaven. Well, if you live in Mosul, you are in heaven. <laughs> so, <laughs> Port of Alers, you need to move to Mosul, it's heaven, yeah. Okay, no, let's carry on. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So God is not shocked that while there are wars, famines, Natural disasters. God is not upset or falls off his throne just because I ask him for property. Just because I ask him for a better car or for the finances to fix my car. Sometimes it's better to fix the car than to go and buy a new car. Works out better. You can fix your car, it's still in a good condition, it just needs some fixing. But let it be according to your faith. Does it help that you trust God for a Ferrari? But you can't trust Him for something small. Don't be stupid. Okay? But as your faith grows. Let's carry on reading. Verse 15. Oh yeah. According to His will, 
He hears us. So in the midst of all these voices, in the midst of all these voices, I am confident. I have the assurance that He has heard me. How many times have you prayed? And you get up, whether you're on your knees, or you sit in a chair, or you are standing, praising and worshiping Him. But when you walk away, when you get up from your knees or from your place of prayer, and you walk away, 10, 20 minutes later, you wonder, you wonder, did He hear me? And you begin to doubt whether He actually heard you. Don't fall in that trap. Be confident. I'm going somewhere. Verse 15. And if, we are, and if we know that He hears us. If we know that He hears us. Here's the key. Here's the prerequisite. If we know He hears us. If we are confident. If we are assured that He hears us. Whatever we Ask, we know that we have the petitions, the thing asked for, the craving, the desire, the requiring that we have asked of Him. If we are assured and we know that He heard us, then whatever we ask, we have the assurance that we can have it. But the natural man will begin to doubt. Maybe it's not God's will. Because I asked him yesterday and I didn't get it today. There are things that I asked God for 25 years ago. One of them, one of the things that I've asked God 25, 30 years ago. No, 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 no longer, longer. 40 years ago is now, what's today's date? 28th of March, is now coming together. After 40 years that I've been asking, is now coming together in seeing the fulfillment of a vision that lies ahead. I didn't start trusting God for property last year. This started just after we got married. There was a time that we lived in the Strand and uh, I wanted to buy, I had to go back to the police force. I had to leave, leave Bible school and uh, went back, joined the police again and I was stationed in the Strand and we were looking at a caravan park that was for sale to buy the caravan park and then, uh, 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 you know, use the caravan park uh, for church and for camping, and for conferences and stuff. So it already started in those years, many, many years ago. And it just kept on growing until we are at a place now. Because you see, I think that God knew the design of the vision. I would have messed it up there then. But now I've got the design, my mind and my spirit. I've got the design. You can go to our website and you can go and look at the picture that I put on there. I found the design that I'm looking for and the way that it should be. Now we're trusting God for divine connection and favor for the right property. We will buy it less than what it is made available for. I declare it because of favor. Amen. That's what I'm asking. So I'm confident that what I'm asking my father, I will have it. I will have it. So just because you didn't get it a week later, the mistake that you make is to begin to doubt your asking. Did God hear me? Is it His will for me? And or you become, uh, 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 you know, disillusioned. The Afrikaans, dus geillusioneerd. Don't know what it means, but it sounds very, very intelligent. All right? Je wordt gedisillusioneerd. You become disappointed, disillusioned, and then it sorts of fade out of your mind. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. 
it begins to fade out of your mind because you think I didn't get what I asked for. Don't stop believing. Don't stop. Don't lose your confidence. Don't lose your assurance. Keep on declaring. Keep on believing. Just like me and my wife. Just like my family. For 40 plus years. 41 plus years. Keep on believing. Until you see the manifestation of the very thing. And I want to guarantee you. Right now. It seems like. Lord now. 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 It, it, it must be now. It must be now. But you know the moment that that thing that you've been trusting God for. Becomes a reality in your life. It doesn't feel like 40 years ago. It feels like it's brand new just now. I just asked God for it now. But if you go and think about it. You've got 40 years plus of sin that you've put in the ground, that you've been asking, that you've been declaring, that you've been trusting, that you've been believing, not doubting, but asking by faith. And I know that you heard me. I know that you heard me. There's no way that you could not have heard me. There's no way. And you keep, and you keep on, you keep on. And after 40 years, when that thing manifests, you forget the 40 years. Do you know how long I've trusted God for a Jaguar? Now that I've got it, it seemed like I got it yesterday. I've been trusting him since yesterday for the car. Now that I've got it. Now I'm excited because my faith has been built. My faith has been stirred up. I can trust him now for something better. So I'm building on what was manifested. What was manifested. So I know that because I've been trusting God and I've been faithful for 40 plus years, trusting God for property, trusting God for my own house, trusting God for property, that when we get that property, we will be able to build on a higher level on that property. Whether it's my own house, we can go for a better house. Builds my faith. Builds my faith. Come on, are you getting something? Are you hearing something where you are listening from? That he hears us, verse, verse 15. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Go to 2 John, just the next two pages. 2 John. And then we're going to get to the awesome part of the word. Verse 9. Now, this is important. You've got to listen to this now. Whoever, because, you know, just look this way. Don't read now. Just look this way. People think that when you become a Christian, you are born again, filled with the Spirit. Now, I, I don't want to put people under condemnation. I don't want to put you under the, the law. I don't want to make it another law that you've got to work for this, and you've got to work for that, and you've got to work to get God's favor, and you've got to work. But, you know, but there are some prerequisites. There are some, what's the word that I can use? I don't even know what the Afrikaans word is. But there are some forward values. For, forward, Waarde, values. So there are some forward values. Voorwaardes. Some prerequisites. In the word of God. It doesn't mean that you work for favor. It means because you love him, you keep his word. You obey his word. It's called, that's the word that, I'm, uh, that I can maybe use. It's called obedience. It's not called by works it's called by obedience. You know, even Paul wrote it. He said, show me your works and I'll show you my faith. Let me show you my works and you show me, my, your, and me, and you show me your faith. Because faith works by works. Works without faith. It doesn't mean that we work for favor. It means that there's something that we live by. There's something that we do by faith. Obedience. To lay hold of the promises of God. Voorwaardes. Prerequisites. Conditions. That's the word. There are some conditions. That we have to abide to. To lay hold of the promises of God. 
You cannot just live any way that you want to and think, oh, God's going to bless me and God's going to be okay with me and stuff like that. But you do just whatever you want to. There's a scripture that says, let everyone examine what he is doing. I think it's in Deuteronomy as well. That says that not doing his own thing like you are doing it right now. Don't do your own thing. Do the God thing. Do the right thing. Amen? Okay, uh, uh, let's, let's carry on. Now, here we go. Verse 9 of Second John. Verse 9. No chapters. Verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide. This is, your, this is your condition. We're going to get to that. And I want you to mark that in your Bible wherever you are. Remember that word. Write it down. Because this is a very, very important word. And does not abide in the doctrine of Christ. Now that word doctrine means the instructions or the teachings of Christ. So if Jesus said give. And it shall be given. Then he didn't say it by chance. He said it by the commandment, the authority, the, the uh, uh, authoritative prescription of his Father. So God said, tell my people that when they give, it shall be given back unto them. Tell my people that if they pray, their prayers will be answered. Tell my people that whatever they ask according to my will, they will receive it. Tell the people that whenever they pray, believing, they shall receive. These are the conditions, the prerequisite. These are the doctrines of Jesus Christ. That's his teachings. He says, so if they abide in the doctrine of, do, uh, uh, not abide, does not have God. Don't get upset with me. I didn't write the book. I didn't say it. I didn't speak it. Jesus said it. The disciples wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That if you do not stay in his doctrines, then what? Then you don't have God. Oh man, I'm upsetting uh, people that are going to listen to this teaching. I'm going to upset a lot of religious spirits with this one. I want to tell you, I'm going to upset a lot of religious spirits with this one. So if you are against prosperity, if you don't teach it like Jesus taught it, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and amplified that you may have it and enjoy it abundantly in abundance. Whatsoever things you ask the Father, whatsoever you desire, give and it shall be given back unto you so that you will reap, etc., 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 the doctrines of Christ. If you don't abide in those doctrines, you don't have God. Aina, ouch, well, ish. Hmm? Is this a hard word? I'm sorry. How do I know that you don't have God? Because you're still poor. Because you're still sick. Oh Lord, if it is your will. That's not his doctrine. Oh, but really, Jesus prayed and said, Father, when he was in the garden, he says, Father, I pray that you will take this cup from me, but not my will be done, but your will be done. And they use that place. And there's one more scripture that says that uh, if it is his will. Uh, I, I just forgot the scripture now. But they take those two scriptures and they take it totally out of context. Completely out of context. Jesus could pray that when he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Because he knew the will of the Father for him was to go and die. That was the will of the Father. That's why he said, Father, please take this cup away, but not my will. Let your will be done. Because he knew that was the will of the Father. So if I know what the will of the Father is, I pray according to his will. Because if I don't pray according to his will, I don't have God. Because if I have God, I know what the will of the Father is. I know what his will is. Why? Because I have the mind of Christ. 
And who knows the Spirit of God better than the Spirit Himself? So because I have the Spirit, I know the mind of God. I know His will. So don't get upset with me when I say that if you don't have the Spirit of God, you will make stupid statements like, oh, it's only materialistic stuff. But yet you wear clothes. Do you know what clothes are made from? Material. I don't see you walking around naked. I don't see you go, woo, happy when you're walking around with torn jeans. Okay, now you buy them torn, but I won't buy them torn. I won't walk around with a poverty mentality, walking around with torn jeans and stuff like that. It's, they, call it, they call it fashion. You pay 600 rand for a jean that's already torn. I wear mine like that man, until it's torn. Okay, no. <laughs> okay, it's a joke. All right. So, but now I, I, I don't see you walking around happy in the streets in it with, you know, your shirt is all torn and dirty. You look like a tramp. You look like a bum in the streets. Have you ever seen a happy bum? A happy tramp? Hmm? You must watch them when they stand in the robots. They've got a style. I've watched some of them. They write on that piece of carton. And then when you approach the robot, you see there they come from the sidewalk. The robot is red. The cars are going to stop now. You see him come, and then he stands in the middle of the street, and then he takes a pose. I've seen one specific person that I know. There was one in Clarksdorp. Whenever we went to the conferences in Stilfontein, there was one at the robot in Clarksdorp. Actually, two of them are two of the robots. In class, the one was a woman, a wife, and a husband, or, or whether they were married or not, I don't know. But they had this, they had this, this, this pose. And uh, I said to my wife at the one time, you remember? I said to her, "Watch, watch, watch. Check him now, check him now." And he would come, and then he would go, take his stand, and hold up his his uh, his carton, you know, the cardboard that's got written in there, and. Uh, Really, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. And then he goes in that sorry state. I've never seen a happy bum. And then he has the audacity to write at the bottom, God bless you. God bless you. You won't write on my guilt. You will not make me feel guilty. If the Holy Spirit doesn't tell me to give, all right, I'm not saying that people don't need help. What I am saying is, if you don't have God, if you are against the blessings of God. Oh, God's trying to teach you something through your circumstances. That is not the Spirit of God. Sorry, get upset. I don't care. I don't work for you. I work for Him. And I only preach what the Word says. It is written. If you don't abide in Jesus' doctrine. Now let's carry on. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Oh man, I want to tell you, that's why I love studying the Word. That's why I love to see what the Word says. That's why I'm in the Word. I read the Word. I preach the Word. I, I, I kiss the Word. I eat the Word. I take the Word in. The Word becomes mine, man. I make it my own. And what am I manifesting? I'm into His doctrines, not a man-made doctrine. You know how many preachers and people are out there that are preaching the doctrines of demons they are teaching people how to uh, you know all everything about demonic activities and how demons work i know i've been there i had a whole library and when i say a library i'm talking about two three thousand books i had boxes and boxes of books that i took off from satanists from people that were involved in satanic rituals Bo uh, books that were in those days banned from South Africa. You couldn't get it from South Africa. It was smuggled in from America. The satanic Bible, how to do witchcraft. How to I had all these books. I, I worked with Satanists. I know what Satan can do. I know what demons can do. 
But then the Lord started changing my attitude in my heart because I knew more about what demons do and how they operate than what I did knowing how the Holy Spirit worked and operated. So something was off balance. And now you have preachers that are having conferences and stuff and teaching you all about the devil. The only thing that I need to know about the devil is, is he's under my feet. That he's been defeated. He's been conquered. He has no power, no authority. He might have influences on the lives of unsafe people. But to me, uh, 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 he's under my feet. He's been defeated. He's got to crawl. He's not even walking to and fro on the face of the earth anymore. He's been defeated. Where he wants to go now, he has to crawl. Amen. Okay, are you getting something this morning so far? This has got to be your mindset. This, is, this has got to be in your heart, in your spirit, when you wake up tomorrow morning. These words, this, these teachings, the doctrines of Christ. So now they are teaching the doctrines of demons. Oh, this is how a demon operates, and this is how this demon do. I can teach you all that stuff, but why do I want to know that? I want to know what happens when the Holy Spirit works. I want to know what happens when I step into the supernatural realm and I'm into that atmosphere called heavenlies. I want to know more about that, man. Because when I know about that and when I have that and I live in those doctrines, no demon in hell can touch me. I'm under the blood. I'm protected. Huh? So now they teach all those other doctrines. And they teach about the Antichrist and the triple six and the rapture and all this kind of stuff. That's not Jesus' doctrines. Jesus never taught. Jesus never taught. None of the disciples ever taught how to cast out a demon. Let's look at all the different kinds of demons that you get. And then we categorize them. We put them in different categories. It's the doctrines of demons. It's not the doctrines of Christ. I understand deliverance. I know how it works. I've casted out demons in more people than I could count. I've seen manifestations that would make you run. That would scare the living daylights out of you. Not impressed. I'm impressed when I see the Holy Spirit begin to move in a meeting. I'm impressed when I see how people's lives are touched when the fire begins to fall. I'm impressed when I teach the doctrines of Christ, the doctrines of the Father, the doctrines of the Holy Spirit, and I see how people are touched by the power and the anointing, and I see how, man, how the atmosphere around them changes. I'm impressed by that. I'm not impressed by any manifestation of any demon. And the only thing that Jesus ever did, He said, go and cast the thing out. He didn't say, go and get into a conversation with the thing. And you will get people. What is your name? Jesus only asked that once. He said, Legion. He said, like a Khanbuti. Now we get into a conversation. How did you get in? Do you think he's going to tell you? Do you th know that demons are lying spirits? So now you ask him, how did you get into this guy? Oh, he, he played glassy glassy or he went to a palm reader. No, 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 no. There's something else. He was involved in something else. He, they're not going to tell you. So I don't get into a conversation. I just say, go in Jesus' name. And they have to obey. That's the doctrines of Christ. Jesus never taught us how to do it. He said, cast the thing out. He said, speak to the mountain. He didn't give us a seven sermon. Chapter one, step one. He said, speak to your circumstances, man, and tell it, move. Come on, say that word. There where you're sitting now. Say, circumstances. I command you. In the name of Jesus. Move. You obstacle, ugly thing, you. Let's carry on. How about the doctrines of Christ? How about the doctrines of Christ? Come on, let's hurry up. But he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you 
Don't get upset with me now. If anyone comes to you and not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house. Nor greet him. And you know who we reserve that for? For the Jehovah Witnesses. Come on. Oh, they preach something different, so I don't even invite them into my, into my homes. There are more than just them. There are more than them. There are those that are preaching. The blessings of God are just materialistic stuff that you cannot take to heaven with you. So stop focusing on the materialistic stuff. Hey, I want to say it again. You wear clothes that are made out of material. Good for you. I don't want to see you walking around naked, you ugly thing. Hmm. The couch that you sit on in your house is materialistic. The house that you live in. I don't see you living under the tree. These are all materialistic stuff. So stop being a hypocrite, you hypocrite. You trusted God for a new car. You could have given the money to the poor. You hypocrite. Let me say it straight. You hypocrite. You're a hypocrite, man. That's not the doctrine of Christ. You know what that is? The word says that's the doctrine that is not of God. And it says, I'm not even allowed to listen to you, invite you into my house. I must just turn away from you. Don't even greet that person. That's why I delete a lot of remarks that people make when they come against the doctrines of Christ. I can see the religious spirit in them. And I delete their remarks from my social page. Not allow you to bring your doctrines, your natural man mindset stuff. You need to get your mind safe, man. I'm not saying that you don't love Jesus. You know, even Peter loved Jesus. Come on, stay with me just 10 more minutes. That's in the natural man, but the spirit man might take a little bit longer. G uh, Peter loved Jesus, am I right? Come on, Marcel Bay. Peter loved Jesus. Come on, Portable, come on your house. Peter loved Jesus. Jesus even said to him, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. The revelation that he had of who Jesus was. Who do you say I am? You're the son of the most high God. Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. The revelation that you got of who I am. But then yet Peter turned around and said, over my dead body, you will go and die. He rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. And he said to Peter, Peter, the day that you repent, the day that you get saved. The, the Afrikaans Bible will say, Petrus, die dag is hier jou bekeer. Peter loved Jesus, but he had a mindset that he had to change. It's called repentance. It's called changing your thinking. So they, they are pastors. They love Jesus. People, they love Jesus. But their mindsets are keeping them away from the Father. And from his blessings. All right. So have you got that word abide? The doctrines, the teachings. All right. Last scripture. Go to John 15. Let's go back to John. John 15. John 15. Not Matthew 15, really. John 15. You know this? But listen to it again from the point of where I started to where we are now. John 15, let's read from verse 1. This has everything to do with whatever. I am the true vine. John 15 verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Okay, that word vine dresser means the land worker or the farmer. Another word there is husbandman. That's what that word vine, vine dresser means. It means he's the land worker, he's the farmer. Every branch in me, here we go now, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So we've got to get to a place where we manifest this word. He takes away. And every branch and every that bears fruit, 
he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit, begins to work on your life. He begins to work on your attitude. He begins to challenge you in your faith. He begins to challenge you in your attitude. He begins to challenge you in your life, in your walk with Him. And it seems like now, you know, there's a pruning. There's, there's, he challenges you to change your mindset. He challenges you to change your actions. He challenges you to change your attitude. He challenges you to change. He's pruning you. Why? Because He wants you to bear even more fruit. Isn't that awesome? That you, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Mark that word abide. Abide in me. I'm going to get to it now. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Now, bearing much fruit means there is a manifestation of the word in your life. That is what it means to bear much fruit. It means that you get to a place where you begin to manifest. Manifest means to show outwardly the change that is happening on the inside. So when you begin to think prosperity... There's got to be an outward manifestation of those blessings, of that prosperity. When you begin to think healing, there's got to be, an, and you stay in the Word, then there's got to be an outward manifestation of an inward work. Come on now. I was having a conference. And I was talking about declaring and speaking. And as I passed somebody that was sitting there, uh, you know, I like to walk around when I preach. And uh, as I said something about declaring and the power of your words, I heard this person making a remark to the person sitting next to, to this person and saying, he mustn't tell me what I must say. He mustn't tell me what I must say. I was, and this is what I heard. I will say what I want to. And then you wonder why your life is in a mess. Stiff-necked. Hard-headed. Afrikaans. Harakwas. Hmm? says that if you abide in me you will bear more fruit more fruit I'm not saying that the, that, the, that, the, that the person or the people don't love Jesus but you've got to get rid of your hard headed stiff naked rebellious harakwas attitude before God that's pruning that's pruning Let's, let's carry on. We're nearly done. <laughs> Verse 5. He who abides in me and I need bears much fruit. For without me you cannot do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw into the fire and they are burnt. You see, I preach stuff that other preachers will not preach because it sounds negative. Oh, Jesus is love. We should just preach love. Love hurts sometimes. Love is sometimes tough. Sometimes you need to hear so that you can be saved. You know that there's a scripture where Paul writes and he says, somebody, this blacksmith did me much harm. I handed him over to the punishers, to the demons, to the devil, so that his soul can be saved. You don't hear preachers preach that. I've preached that. We don't want to preach a negative word. That's not negative. 
Jesus said, if you don't abide in me, if you don't preach, if you preach any other doctrines, if you don't bear fruit, what's going to happen? You're going to be cast out. Does it say that he doesn't love you? Come on, are you hearing me there in your house? There in Portable, you're in Mosul Bay. Doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love you. It means that you have to go and look at your life and begin to take introspection of your own life and say, where am I in my relationship with the Father? Where am I now in my relationship with God? Where am I in my relationship with Jesus Christ? Where am I in my relationship with the Holy Spirit? Where am I finding myself right now so that I can bear more and more and more and more fruit? I don't want to be casted out. So if He tells me I'm doing something wrong, I'm going to repent and change my attitude. I'm being challenged right now where I'm sitting. Ek sikkel nog a bieke betei plekkies. But at least I'm, I'm listening to that little voice. Tomorrow I might fall. Or yesterday I might have tripped over something. In it. But thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. At least I'm progressing. Come on, let's finish. Verse 7. If you abide in me. Now you know my teaching on that word abide. Me know. That's the Greek word. Me know. Me know. This is how you remember it. Whenever you hear abide. It means me know going anywhere. You talk like um Indians. Not, in, in, not the ones that you know or that you eat the curry. I'm talking about um Indians. <laughs> like in America, okay? Me no, me no going anywhere. That word abides means this, to endure. You stick it out, to stay, to remain. You're not going anywhere. To stay in a given place. You stay in the Word. You stay in Christ. You stay in His teachings. You remain in His doctrines. You don't go anywhere outside of His doctrines. No matter how other people are trying to influence you, whenever they tell you something that is contrary to what Jesus said, run from those people. Run from those people. Correct them. If they don't want to be corrected, then you leave them. Anything that is not in line with the word of God. If they want to get you out of the blessings, out of prosperity, out of your healing, out of remaining on this earth. They want you to go and fly away with a rapture. They want you to be prepared for the triple six. I'm not preparing myself for a triple six. I'm preparing myself to get the triple six under the feet of the church, under the feet of the sons and daughters of Almighty God. We as the church, as the body of Jesus Christ, we ain't going nowhere. The Antichrist and his triple six will be the ones that will be removed. That's what it was like in the days of Noah. The unrighteous were removed and the righteous remained. We ain't going nowhere. Any other teaching like that is not the doctrines of Jesus Christ. This is not a nice word. This is a hard word. But I'll preach it. I'm not afraid. I'll preach it. You abide in you. Okay, verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. My words abide in you. My words stay in you. My words remain in you. My words stay in a given place in you. My words endure in you. you now, don't get upset with me. This is in red. I didn't say it. I didn't write it. You will ask what you desire. Now, listen quickly. I want to get to the end. You will have religious mindset people that will come to you and say, Jesus is not your personal ATM machine. God is not your personal ATM machine. No, he's not. We don't snap our fingers and God just spews out money. No, he's not my personal ATM machine. He's my personal provider. 
That he is. He's my personal savior. He's my personal healer. And I know his will. And if his words abide in me, and I abide in him, Father, I pray that they will be one as we are one. I in them, they in me, I in you, you in them. John 17, when Jesus prayed, he said, it's not just let them be one as we are one. It's let them be one as we are one. So let them be one with us as I am one with you. I in you, you in me. So if he abides in me and I abide in him and they in me and I in them, if I, I will ask what I desire. It's got nothing to do with him being my personal ATM and I snap my fingers and God just provides. No, it's because I abide in him. It's because I know his will. It's because I go across according to the conditions, the prerequisites. I know what the Word says. I live in His teachings, in His doctrines. I apply it to my life. And because I apply it to my life, He provides. Because I live and abide in it, He takes care of me according to His riches that is in glory. Got nothing to do with being my personal ATM machine and I snap my fingers. Get a life, man. Don't try and put me on a guilt trip just because you don't believe the doctrines of Christ. This is his doctrine. This is his doctrine. Come on, just I'm, 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 I'm on the landing strip. The airplane have landed. This is his doctrines. So don't get upset with me. I didn't write this. I'm just preaching it. I'm just the messenger. And I prayed this morning. I said, Father, let them hear your voice through my voice. Let them hear your voice. This is his voice. Thank you, Sheila. This is his voice. You will ask what you desire. A lot of people ask what they desire, but they ask with wrong attitudes. They don't abide. They don't stay. They ask now. 20 minutes later, negative words. <laughs> Yeah, man, yeah, yeah, 20 minutes, next day, three days later, negative, 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 you're not abiding, you're not abiding, you're not abiding, but thank God for His grace, because He gives you another chance, and another chance, and another chance, and another chance, look at me, look at my lips, it's time for you to grow up. In other words, get to a higher level of maturity. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. I can show you the word, I cannot make you mature. I can help you. And it shall, if you will buy, and you will ask what you desire, and it might, when I and the Father think about it, we will decide if it is going to be done for you, according to some preachers and some people. No. And it shall be done. That's a uitgemaakte saak. It's a made out case. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. What's the fruit that will be uh, bore, bear, beard, born, gebar? What will be the fruit that you will show? Okay. What will be the fruit? What you've asked. So when I ask, and I received what I asked for, that is the fruit of my asking. So here I'm bearing fruit. And this coincides with what I said earlier. So now that fruit becomes a level that I can build on to grow to another level. 
for better fruit, for much fruit. But with every fruit that you bear goes responsibility. What is the responsibility? To abide in Him. And to stop spewing out negative words, negative stuff. And when you do, repent as quick as you can. And say, Father, that was not your words. These were not your words. These were not your words. Forgive me. That was the flesh man. That wasn't even the devil. That was yay, man. Oh, the devil made me say that. Yes, sit down us. You said it. You said it. Are you with me? Somebody, are you, are you guys getting it here in Mosul Bay? Here in Mosul Bay, um, Portable. Are you getting something? I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Hmm? <coughs> the devil didn't say it. The natural man said it. So the next moment, stop and say, back in, I've got to get back into the spirit. What did the word say? The word says. You don't have to say, oh, the word says, John 12, verse 90, 74, 11, or whatever. You can just say, it is written. But the word says, Father, sorry, I confess. Repent. Holy Spirit, help me to change my mind. Right now, help me to think differently. I want to bear fruit. I want to bear fruit. I want to bear the fruit of Jesus' doctrines. Don't you think that that will make the father happy? See his children blessed? The father is not happy when you struggle with poverty. He's not happy. He's sad. He's heartbroken. He's upset. Because he has given you all things to enjoy. Yesterday I was watching something on TV. And uh, while we were busy with the, uh, the website, I watched something. And uh, the, 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 I don't know whether it was a song between movies or whatever, but it was this person standing and the sun was setting and looking out over the sunset that came. And, uh, and this came up in my spirit. Life. So beautiful. Oh yeah, this was it. I, 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 I watched a program, I think it was on Quela. And, uh, or what's the other one? No, it was Quela. With, with that broadcaster, Hannes. And they had a documentary, an insert on Bloberg Strand. Now we lived there when we just moved down to Cape Town from Pretoria many years ago. And uh, they had a documentary on, on Bloberg Strand on a little... A, 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 a restaurant there, it's called the, 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 the uh, uh, something house, the, the Batais or, or something like that. And, uh, and I know where it is because we lived two or three blocks from it and we would walk past it, but now they've renovated it and made it very beautiful. And how how the people in Bloberg would come together and, you know, and they have these little stalls and stalikis and stuff and they have got people coming there to sing and play music, uh, well-known artists that come and play there. And, how they, and I looked at this and how they say this is such a nice place to live in Bloberg Strand and you've got the beach and the atmosphere and the people. And, that, and then it struck me, you know, life supposed to be beautiful and enjoyed but we don't do it we don't enjoy it because we get so busy trying to make a living that we forget to how to have a life ungodly unsafe people know more about having a life than sons and daughters of God that's trying to make a living You know, right now, you might be financially struggling. You can still enjoy life. It's an attitude. It's an attitude. When we were poor, when we lived in Bloberg Strand, we had nothing. Now, you know my story of how we would walk behind people, you know, eating ice cream. We were so poor, we couldn't afford ice cream. But we went down to the beach to go and enjoy the beach. No money, no food, no nothing. And we would walk. Be I would walk behind the people, and uh, 
and I would watch, watch, watch. And if the ice cream begins to drip, I will hold out my hand. Suddenly, you know, this guy would see a hand appears around his waist, and I would catch the drippings and have my sons lick my hand and my daughter. Okay, it's a story. It's my imagination. It's my story. I can tell it the way that I want to. But you know what? We still went down to the beach just to go and enjoy the beach, sit on the beach, not knowing where our food is going to come from, not knowing how we're going to pay for the, for the flat, not knowing where we're going to get the furniture from, sleeping on three mattresses, five people on three mattresses. It's time to enjoy life. Let me finish. If my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. That your joy may be full. Just a little bit further down. So what is the requirement? What is the condition? If you abide in my word, and my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire. One more scripture. You can write it down and then you can close your Bibles. John 17. Jesus is praying. You know this. Remember now, John 15. If my words abide in you and you abide in my words, you will ask Whatsoever you desire, so that you bear much fruit. And by that, my Father is glorified. Jesus prays. He says, Father, that which you have sent me to accomplish, I've accomplished that. What was that? I, verse 8, for I have given to them the words. Ria, portable. John 17, verse 8. You got it? John 17, I can see there. I'm here Marcel Bay, but I can see in portable. For, verse 8, For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received. Them suggesting they've received the words. Them is not in the original text that Jesus said. Jesus said, I have given them your words and they receive. Bottom line. Why? Because he said, whatsoever you ask, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe, and you will have it. So he says, Father, if they abide in my words, and my, in my word, and my words abide in them, stays, remain, it's settled in them. I say nothing unless I first heard it from my Father. So when I speak it, you ought to know that that is what the Father wants you to have. That is what the Father wants you to hear. That is the will and the purpose of the Father for you when I speak it. So this is what the Father says. Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, whatsoever, He will give it to you, you will have it, He will get it to you so that your joy can remain, so that your joy can be full, so that you can bear much fruit, so that my Father is glorified by it. So Father, I have given them your word and they receive. That's it. Bottom line. Amen. Goodbye. They receive. Kla. No question about it, no double-mindedness about it, no nothing about it. We are supposed to receive whatsoever we ask. Don't let people tell you God is not an ATM machine. I know that, but He's my Father, and He owns the cattle on a thousand deal. He owns the, the gold. He owns the silver. Everything that I need not to exist, but to have a good, happy, joyful life is up in my storeroom where I go to and I begin to dispatch dispense that's my dispensary I begin to dispatch to dispense whatever it is that I need to be happy to have a good life to enjoy life and to give glory and credit to my father is up there and I dispense it on this earth so that I can enjoy life and bear more fruit it's time Sila. it's time how much word is in you? 
How much are you in the Word? Every now and again, every day, let me put, rephrase that, every day, you can close your Bibles, every day we are bombarded with natural-minded people, natural-minded ideas, natural-minded words. But you have a choice. What it is that you want to listen to. Now, don't just imagine natural-minded people as sinners. They're ungodly. There are a lot of natural-minded preachers. A lot of natural-minded Christians in this world. They love Jesus. Can I just say this one more thing? Jesus said, you know, they got to Jesus and they said, Father, we've been casting out demons in your name. They listened to us. You know, they come back. They were so excited. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. They didn't say heaven. He said, will enter the kingdom. There are a lot of lovely, saved, blood-washed Christians, people, out there. But they're still living outside the kingdom. What is the kingdom? It's righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. They are so miserable. They are so poor. They sick, they stressed, they worries, they not in the kingdom. So you can be saved, but live outside the kingdom. And this is where a lot of traditional religious mindset people are kept by Dominus and reverence and other preachers. And then their mindsets spill over into their people. And then their people are trying to get others to be like them. Here's the doctrine of Christ. It's called the Bible. Not the doctrine of a church. The doctrines of Christ. Get into the doctrines of Christ. Get somebody that will teach you the doctrines of Christ and not the doctrines of a church. I tried that when I was in a denomination. It brought me to a certain point and it couldn't take me further. And I had to change my doctrines to Bible. Doctrines can only get you a certain level. But the Bible, the Word, will get you where you're supposed to be. The fulfillment of your purpose and your destiny. 